professor and attorney who has helped folks whose lives have been devastated by dangerous products and hazardous substances. Jeffrey Simon has committed his life to pursuing justice for those in need. In his new book, Last Rights, The Fight to Save the Seventh Amendment, he sounds the alarm for the public about threats to our justice system and your constitutional rights. We are fortunate to have him join us today as our guest. I'm Ware Wendell, and this is Professor Jeffrey Simon in conversation. Professor Jeffrey Simon, welcome to End Conversation. Pleasure to be with you. You are an attorney with over 30 years of experience, and you and I have um, quite a bit in common. We're both from Fort Worth. You practice law in Dallas now, but you're also a professor at the SMU Dedman School of Law. I teach a bit as well, and I find it very rewarding. How long have you been a professor at SMU? This is my second year, and I teach mass tort litigation there. And for our audience, when we talk about torts, um, under the law, there's two two types of harms. You can have a criminal harm or a civil harm. And if it's a civil, civil harm, that's what we call a tort. So mass tort litigation, that's when a lot of people have been hurt. Um, maybe a community has been hurt, correct? Right. When a, a number of people claim to have been harmed uh, in the same or similar way, uh, by a defendant or a group of defendants. And what do you find most rewarding about teaching? Oh, uh, I love everything about it, to be quite frank. Um, I love uh, being a part of uh, a student's um, trajectory towards whatever they're going to do next. Um, I love when uh, they realize something they hadn't thought about before. Um, they gather insight about something and I see it coming alive and it creates a lot of energy in the room and it, it's it, exhilarating for me. Well, I appreciate the time that, that you put into teaching because you're bringing the next generation of advocates uh, to the to the forefront who are going to help a lot of people in the course of their careers, just as you have in yours. One of the ways that you're helping all of us, um, including the public, is by authoring this new book, Last Rights. It is a it is a fantastic book, Jeffrey. I, I know how much work goes into producing something like that. Talk to me about your motivation for writing this book, and it's it's really a wake up call for the public about the threats that we all face when it comes to our constitutional right to trial by jury. Well, I appreciate your kind sentiments about the project. Um, my book, Last Rights, exposes how large corporations and the politicians they pay are deliberately robbing you and every American consumer of their rights to hold reckless companies that hurt or cheat them accountable to the judgments of juries and how we must push back to restore our rights before we lose them forever. In settings like this one, you know, where we can talk about cutting edge issues in litigation and engage in robust debates about what are the best uses of our civil justice system. But in boardrooms of some of America's largest corporations, wealthy power brokers plan for how they can most effectively dismantle or skew that system for their own gain. My book explains how they do that and why it endangers public safety, consumer protection, and personal freedoms. I really appreciate you focusing on the Seventh Amendment in this book because it, it's it's a part of the Constitution that goes overlooked too often. Um, when people think about their constitutional rights, the First Amendment comes to mind, the right to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, maybe the Second Amendment the right to bear arms or the fourth amendment with the right to privacy. And, and you talk about the seventh amendment, the right to trial by jury. 
And this is the system that was entrusted to us by our founders. They were rebelling against this because here in America, we were being deprived of the right to trial by jury. And it's one of the very best ways that everyday citizens, hardworking families can hold power to account in our society. Oh, I agree. And as I talk about in the book, and I'll paraphrase here, uh, Thomas Jefferson described trial by jury as the only system devised by man that can hold its government to the principles of the Constitution. Uh, whereas in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, from whence we came and then rebelled, um, disputes, civil disputes over money, over a contract, over harms caused by the recklessness uh, of one to another were resolved by the crown or by nobility rather than by the people of the community who have to live by the rules of engagement and the rule of law. And our framers thought that a bedrock of democracy, of the people shall rule, was the right that they shall decide legal disputes in trials by jury. That's exactly right. Uh, here at Texas Watch, we refer to trial by jury and, and to the jury as our smallest, our most local, our least corruptible form of government because you can't lobby jurors. That would be called tampering under the law. That's illegal. And so we get people from the community to come together and to sit in judgment, whether it's six jurors or 12 jurors, and to bring their collective life experiences, everything that they've learned about, about being a citizen in, in our state and in our country, we, they bring that to bear and assess the facts, they weigh the evidence, they decide who's telling the truth and what that community's response is to that alleged harm. And so it, it's a it's a really beautiful system when you think about it, because we trust ourselves to govern ourselves. And as you said, it's how we keep our our government accountable. Um, it's really the linchpin of our country. Well, I, that's beautifully said. And, you know, as I talk to law students about, uh, there are a couple of things to understand uh, about trial by jury and how important it is to our democratic values. One is, is that we all understand by our moral compass, or at least we should, um, that personal worth, financial worth, and self-worth have nothing to do with each other that the life of every single person is just as important as the other, their welfare and their dignity. And a courtroom is the only place in which a person of ordinary means can stand equally against the most powerful corporation in the world if a jury decides that that corporation has harmed them. The fact that the corporation has more power and resources certainly can affect how the case is presented in terms of you know, a, a lack of resources can affect the type of case that's put on. But at the end of the day, the testimony of a credible person, no matter their size of their pocketbook, is just as important as that of the most, most wealthy corporation. And beyond that, our trials are governed by evidence, not by rhetoric, not by political sentiment. And so it is in trials by jury, as opposed to any other form of debate, where there are rules which prevent being drowned out simply by the fact that somebody is louder or more powerful. It, it's the closest thing we have to a level playing field. Uh, and it's a meritocracy. The side that is telling the truth should win. And that's why the jury is so important in evaluating all of that evidence. You you talked about teaching a course on mass torts, and we talked about how that's a widespread harm. That's not a crime. It's brought through our civil courts. You tell a story in your book, early on in the book, about asbestos litigation. And folks will be aware of, of what asbestos is. It's a substance that's been used widely for many, many years. And we know, and we've known for many decades, the harmful effect it has on our bodies. You can either develop 
asbestosis, which I'm going to grossly overstate this, but as scarring of the lungs or mesothelioma, which is a very rare cancer that is extremely deadly. What did I get wrong there, Jeffrey? Nothing. You said it perfectly. So since the 1930s, and you talk about this in your book, employees have been suffering, they've been bringing claims, uh, but corporations kept using asbestos in very unsafe ways. And you tell the story of Barbara Beringer, who, is it Beringer or Beringer? I want to make sure Beringer. I get that. Beringer. Um, I believe you were about a decade or so into your career. You'd already tried 30 or so cases at that point, which is a very impressive trial record. But but working with her and taking up her cause really had an effect on you. Would you talk with our audience about her? What made her story so special? What made her so special as a person to you? Sure. And I appreciate the chance to do so. Um, the Barbara Beringer case was transformative for me because I developed a personal relationship with her and her husband that transcended uh, my professional uh, representation of them. And because the outcome of the case, not just the trial itself, but what happened next, um, was an inflection point for me in understanding uh, the difference between trial by jury and a fair system of laws. And basically, it went like this. I represented Barbara Berenger, who suffered from malignant mesothelioma. And I tried her case to verdict against Alcoa, the large aluminum smelting company, uh, in October of 2005. Uh, our allegation was that Alcoa um, had recklessly exposed her husband, who was a worker there, to asbestos fibers and recklessly allowed him uh, to expose his wife, recklessly in the following respects. They understood, we alleged, that asbestos could cause terrible diseases, but they didn't warn or protect him at all. And secondly, they understood that a person didn't have to work with the asbestos themselves. They simply had to create um, or be around clouds of asbestos that were breathed by someone else, and they could get sick too. And so what happened was, is her then husband, a man named uh, John Alford, was heavily exposed to asbestos at Alcoa, and he would bring his work clothes home, which were covered with asbestos, and she would wash them for him, and she would shake the dust off the clothes because you don't just put that in a washer. And unfortunately, she then would be exposed to the same asbestos he was. And they both perceived that this was just dust, that there's no reason to be fearful of dust, but unlike dust, asbestos fibers are extremely cancerous. They also cause that terrible disease, asbestosis. Unfortunately, the nature of these fibers is once they're inhaled in the lung, they take years to do their mischief. It takes decades before the scarring or the genetic mutations resulting in cancer become manifest. And so long after their marriage ended, literally decades later, he developed asbestosis from his exposure at Alcoa and died from it. And she developed mesothelioma from the very same asbestos that he brought home from Alcoa. And so we tried the case in Dallas County and got a very large verdict, $25.7 million, which was the largest verdict at that time in a single mesothelioma case uh, in Dallas County's jurisprudence. What happened next, unfortunately, was entirely predictable because this was a time in which, and unfortunately, we're still at least in a, you know, a, the aftermath of that time, a, a natural sequela of that time, where many judges were elected specifically because they promised that they were going to get back at trial lawyers, right? And they were going to end frivolous lawsuits. They were basically going to legislate from the bench. And they'd gotten those appointments in many instances in the first time from, you know, then Governor Bush or then Governor Perry, and then they got reelected on those platforms and what have you. Well, back then, we're talking about 2005, six, and seven, or we're really 2005 and six, the Dallas County Court of Appeals uh, had many justices on it. I don't mean every one, but many of them. 
who got elected in significant part by promising to do harm to tort plaintiffs, right? To get back at those trial lawyers. And in the Barbara Berenger case, they simply reversed the unanimous verdict of the Dallas County jury and offered it rendered, I should say, a take nothing judgment for Alcoa. They went from losing a unanimously decided trial to winning it with a very tersely worded opinion that basically said, we disagree with the conclusions reached by the jury and therefore Alcoa wins. Now that's the worst form of judicial activism and couldn't be more antithetical to the notion of judicial conservatism. But what we saw in Texas over many years is that judicial conservatism was a ruse. It was simply judicial activism on behalf of the corporate benefactors who want to be held unaccountable for the harms they do to ordinary people. And when that happened, when we got that very large verdict and when it got reversed on appeal, I decided then and there that I would A, one day tell this story, which I have in the book, and B, spend the rest of my career trying to fight for good laws and not just good people. And I've been doing that ever since. One of the things that you discovered through your investigation in her case was there was an internal memo at the company dating back to 1948, I believe. That's right. That spoke to the threats present in the workplace. And just to paint a picture for the audience, this is aluminum smelting, melting aluminum ore in these big pots. And the, the insulation was asbestos. And then you would jackhammer that out over the course of, I believe, days, you said in the book. So asbestos fibers are being jackhammered into the environment. People are breathing it into their lungs. It's coating their clothes. As you said, Barbara and every other spouse who was washing clothes at home um, thought it was just dust from the work site, just dirt. And you had discovered this memo dating back to 1948 that said that they need to wear respirators, that they shouldn't take contaminated clothes home, correct? That's right. And the Court of Appeals disregarded the memo. They said it wasn't material. It wasn't important for some reason. That's correct. And we should talk about what that means, right? Which is that when they're reviewing a trial court record, you know, that which has been transcribed by the court reporter, they're not reading the memo itself, even though the memo was in evidence. They simply reviewed the record and concluded that whatever that memo actually said, and it wasn't a memo, it was actually a health and safety book authored by Alcoa, which said, A, when around asbestos, workers need to be wearing respirators, which they didn't provide John Alford, and B, that people who work with toxic or disease-causing substances at Alcoa shouldn't be taking their work clothes home for the risk of contaminating others. So it was an astonishing piece of evidence that we contended was directly on point, that our expert witnesses, experts in public health and safety, as well as the development of knowledge historically about asbestos disease said is on point this company understood the risks posed both to Mr. Alfred, but also to his then wife, Barbara Berenger, and they disregarded them. And a jury agreed unanimously that was true. And then three justices on the Dallas Court of Appeals just said, we don't think the memo, you know, is of any moment. We're reversing. Of course, never having reviewed the memo themselves. And so many because lives. That, and, and, and what I argue is, because that was really their mandate. It was really their political ideology to do so. That's what I argue. Now, I wanna be clear. It's not that I am alleging that anybody behaved unethically. It's that they were not objective and they were not objective because they ran on a political platform, I contend, not to be. 
and that that political platform is not only anti-consumer, right? It is antithetical to the Seventh Amendment, to the right to trial by jury, in respect that these cases should be decided by jurors, unless there is egregious legal error. There was no egregious legal error. They didn't find that the jury decided the case based on the wrong set of laws. They simply disregarded their factual conclusion, even though they never heard the evidence in the case. And my argument is that comes from political ideology and not from scrutinizing rigorous legal analysis. And we count on our judges to be impartial, to be independent, to discharge their duties under the law faithfully, without fear or favor of either side. You don't want a judge that's going to go out of their way to favor plaintiffs or defendants. Correct. You want a judge to be fair and, frankly, to give deference to the jury's factual determinations. Because under the law, the jury is the fact finder. If you seat a jury, if a jury is weighing that evidence, they are the fact finder. The judge is the gatekeeper in terms of what laws is going to be applied when the jury applies the fact to the law, facts to the law. But that jury is the fact finder and they play a central role. And when you have discovered evidence like an internal book, a memo that talks about the threats on the job site, that should be given a lot of weight and a lot of deference. Um, this is a substance that I think a lot of people is, believe is no longer used, but it's still present. In the environment, you cite uh, studies that show from 1999 to 2017, we've lost between 236 and 277,000 lives in the United States of America to asbestos exposure. 2019 alone, over 40,000 lives taken from asbestos. It, it, is, it is insidious to think that we are still exposed to this. I'm very grateful to advocates like you who have pushed this forward because the government hasn't protected us enough from this known harm. You tell a very moving story. And again, I recommend the book highly. People should buy the book and read this because I'm not going to do it justice now. But you're at Barbara's funeral with her husband, Leroy, and you're standing there uh, at the side of, of her casket, I believe. And... Leroy says she believed in you because you took up her case. And then you write, that moment changed me. In the best of circumstances, the mirrors in our minds reflect the best in ourselves. After Barbara was buried, I made a promise to fight to protect good laws and change bad ones through public advocacy, not just trial work. And we see that here as you've produced this book, Jeffrey. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah, I. we tried the case in October of 2005, um, I and, and an associate that was working with me. And we got this big verdict and I called Barbara and, and Leroy at home because she was in very declining health and I had sent her home. And they were absolutely elated. Um, Barbara could barely talk, both by her joy that her plight had been validated by the jury and also because she was very short of breath from mesothelioma. And she died in January, which was just three months later. And I went to her funeral. And uh, as the funeral concluded um, and uh, the uh, family, her husband and, and their family had finished their processional first. I got up when it was my time in the row to leave. And Lord Leroy came back down the aisle and he took me by the hand and he said, can I talk to you for a minute? Leroy, you can talk to me all day. And we, he took me down by the casket. And by this point, everybody had filed out. It was just the two of us. And um, he lifted the, the casket door and he leaned forward 
his other hand gripping mine and mine gripping his. And he said, Barbara, I love you. Goodbye. And he kissed her on the forehead and he lowered the casket. And I just sat there very still holding his hand. And he said, Jeffrey, she, she believed in you. And I said that I believed in her. And the light went on for me that what I do is not just a job or a career. It is a purpose. It is a calling. And that working for people like them, allowing allowing them to become a part of my soul, part of my family, and me and theirs. is a unique gift, one I'm going to try to pay forward. And one day I'll get it right, but I'm trying real hard. It, it's truly a sacred duty when someone trusts you with, with their story, their cause, to bring that forward. I will always remember, Jeffrey, in 2005, I was walking the halls of the Texas Capitol with men who were dying of mesothelioma. Because as you know, in 2005, uh, lawmakers were taking up a bill on behalf of the companies that threatened and killed their workers to protect those companies, not the workers. And so these men were in their last weeks, months of life, and they were using their time to try to tell the lawmakers their story and what it was like. And as you know, Jeffrey, having worked for so many of these hardworking people, mesothelioma is not an easy death. It's a hard death. And particularly cruel. It's very cruel. And to walk with these men um, and to see them using their time like that showed me how important this was to them. They didn't want this to happen to other people. And, um, and I'll always remember them. And, I wanted to tell you, Jeffrey, you did justice by Barbara and court, and you're doing justice by her by bringing her story forward here in your excellent book. You also highlight another very widespread threat to the Seventh Amendment, our right to trial by jury, in the form of arbitration. We talk a lot about arbitration at Texas Watch. Arbitration was originally intended to resolve disputes between two parties of equal bargaining power. Company A has a dispute with company B and they wanna work it out between themselves. They don't wanna to go to court. They just wanna get it resolved quickly because they do business with one another and they wanna move on. And uh, we have a federal law, the Federal Arbitration Act that our courts have over-interpreted in my estimation. For sure. It, it's as soon as a judge sees the word arbitration, they refer the case to arbitration, whether it should be an arbitration or not. And, and the harm comes about because this is often buried in the fine print. You know, when you click accept on your, on your phone, um, as you're on a website, or it could be on the back of a receipt or as a condition of being hired to work somewhere. If you don't read that fine print, you may be, just giving away your constitutional right to trial by jury, which as we talked about, it's one of the main ways that we hold power accountable in our country. And, and so the issue here is when it's pre-dispute, when you don't know what that dispute is going to be later, but you're being asked to give away your rights right now as a condition of getting hired or purchasing the product or what have you, it's mandatory and it's binding because I think a lot of people, if they know about arbitration, which is a private dispute resolution process that has legal effect. What that arbitrator finds is going to be binding on you. Your right to appeal is virtually non-existent. The laws don't have to be applied strictly under arbitration. 
You have very limited rights to discovery, if any. Um, and, and so if that arbitrator or that panel of arbitrators finds against you, it's the end of the road for you um, in, in almost every case, unless you can show bias or what they call manifest disregard of the law. And they've made that bar so high that it's it's basically impossible to clear it. And so you tell the story in the book about taking up the cause of a family friend, Chris Malik, who had been a very successful businessman and he had produced a movie. And now he was trying to get that movie distributed by a very large studio. And so I wanna turn, turn it back over to you to tell us about Chris's story because I think it shows how the courts regard arbitration and Chris was not an unsophisticated consumer. He was a very, very successful businessman and arbitration still had a very harmful effect on him. Right, so arbitration is for ordinary consumers or small business people, a trap door to a predator's dungeon. And uh, that's what happened to Chris. So um, Chris Malik is uh, and was um, a very talented, uh, independent movie, documentary, and film producer. And he produced a film called Middlemen, which was released in 2010, that was a semi-autobiographical story about a part of his life. It was inspired by true events, but it certainly also had, you know, intended fictionalized features. And it was a terrific movie with a great cast. It starred Luke Wilson, James Kahn from The Godfather, uh, Kevin Pollack, Terry Crews, Gabriel Macht from Suits. Um, it really was a terrifically uh, cast film. And it was about essentially the birth of the internet in relation to anonymous payment systems basically how people began gambling online or purchasing adult content online using a credit card, which we take for granted today. But Chris Malik basically invented. He's basically the person who successfully commercially transformed the internet in terms of the use of a credit card that was reliable, safe, anonymous, and not stolen. And he tells that story in Middlemen. He spent most of his personal wealth to produce the film. He spent $28 million to produce the film. His money, which was most of what he had, it was his opus, his life's work. And it was extremely well received by people who screened it, including Oliver Stone, who said that it was a magnificent film sure to succeed. It won film awards. It knocked people's socks off on the screen tests where they determine whether or not the film is commercially viable. And Paramount Pictures said they wanted the film. They wanted to market the film and release it. Now, this is important because an independent film producer like Chris doesn't have access to 3,000 movie theaters nationwide, but Paramount does. And so at that time, especially when it was not what it is today to try to just release a film for um uh, demand streaming or cable or what have you, um, a big box office release was a very important part of the success of the film. It's where most of the money from production of the film would be recovered. Anyway, he entered a an agreement with them for them to promote and distribute the film. And just to put it mildly, uh, he believed very strongly that they breached that agreement in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. They didn't release the film widely. They didn't promote the film like they said, like he said they should. 
And when he brought the case to me and I reviewed all the materials he had, I concluded that he was right. That was my legal opinion. That there was a contract which described what Paramount's obligations were. And in my legal opinion, they breached them significantly. And the way they breached them caused the film to fail at the box office when it otherwise shouldn't have. That was my view of it. But I uh, saw something in the contract that I knew was problematic in a couple of different ways. One was there was a reference to arbitration proceedings in the event of a dispute, but there were no terms of arbitration to be found within it. In other words, it's not just whether to arbitrate that matters, but what are the terms of arbitration to be? Will there be a robust, robust discovery process or will there not? Will there be one arbitrator or three and who will decide who those are? all the rest of it. And I said, look, they're going to try to move this case to arbitration as soon as we file it. I need to know whether or not you agreed to arbitrate. If you did, it affects your legal rights and we'll deal with it. But I need to understand, did you ever sign an agreement where the terms of arbitration are spelled out? Where you agreed to arbitrate in a way that involves A, B, C, D, E, and F. And these are the terms of arbitration. He said, no, I've never even seen that. Okay. We filed a case, they move for arbitration, and they produce the agreement in support of arbitration. This is an LA Superior Court. And there are terms of arbitration that are draconian for him. He can't conduct discovery other than 10 interrogatories. He can't take depositions. He has substantially less discovery rights and therefore the ability to prove his case than he would just under the rules of discovery in the state of California or frankly in any other state. He didn't sign it. There is no contract with his signature on it that includes those provisions. What happened was, is that there was some exhibit somewhere, sometime in relation to this contract that Paramount signed. He never saw it and he didn't sign it. So it should be self-evident that if he didn't agree to those terms, he shouldn't be bound by them. That was my argument to the trial court. She issued an opinion based on the pleadings the day before we argued the hearing that just said, uh, you know, arbitration provisions are enforceable and I'm going to enforce it. And when I showed up for the hearing, I said, judge, I'm not arguing that they're enforceable, but they have to be mutually agreed upon. That's just plain old contract law. He didn't agree to this. They can't demonstrate that he can. They can't produce a contract with his signature where he agreed to those provisions. Basically, her view of that was go tell the arbitrators. I mean, it's the most conclusory and circular logic imaginable, but that's what she did. And once we were in arbitration, right, we were where Paramount lives, right? Paramount is a big company. They wind up in all kinds of commercial disputes like any big company does that tra transacts enough business. And they try to refer them to arbitration. And arbitration is a place where people who would never make it as jurors because they have work experience or personal experience which would suggest that they are invested in some way, shape, or form in the nature of these disputes, would never be allowed to sit. And in this case, one of the jurors had spent three decades, her, excuse me, arbitrators, but they're jurors, right? Had spent three decades herself defending a big movie studio in commercial disputes. Wow. And was a colleague of the defense lawyer who was representing Paramount. But that's not objective evidence of bias. It's certainly the kind of bias where you would get them off for cause in jury selection, or at the very least, you'd use a peremptory strike to have someone that similarly situated. There was nothing we could do. Now, I don't mean to imply, again, and I say this in the book, I'm not in, uh, accusing that arbitrator of something unethical. I'm simply saying that a lifetime of work experience is awfully hard to set aside in a case in which you're supposed to be perfectly objective, right? And no, no particular facts going in and having no connection to any of the parties, including a friendship 
with the other side. And so that is, in my estimation, part of the rigged nature of arbitration. He didn't agree to the terms of arbitration, which were terribly onerous on him because we couldn't conduct the discovery to prove matters we otherwise, I believe, would have. And secondly, because you wind up with people on the panel that would have too much obvious partiality to be a juror in a case in a court. And arbitration, as you said, it, it's a creature of contract. It arises from the contract. And to have a valid contract, you have to have a meeting of the minds. And here they couldn't produce an agreement that had been signed by both parties. And yet that judge, I described it earlier as them being deferential to arbitration, deferred to arbitration. They saw the word arbitration, it's going to arbitration. Now you can figure that out somehow with the arbitrators, which is hard and expensive and impossible. And the other point, by limiting discovery to that degree, it, it prejudices the plaintiff, the party bringing the suit, because the plaintiff is the one who has the burden of proof. Exactly. You have to prove your case. And to prove your case, you have to have evidence. And if you can't gather that evidence, you can't prove your case. And the other thing that you touched on there, which is really important in the, in the literature, in the academic literature, they refer to it as the repeat player problem in right. arbitration. You know, let's say that you're a, we work a lot on insurance issues. Let's say that you're a policyholder, your insurance company denies your claim wrongfully under their contract, under our laws. And, um, and they send this to arbitration, which we've fought against this, but they're trying, they're trying, insurance companies have been trying to get these cases sent to arbitration. Let's say it goes to arbitration. Do you think they're going to see me very often? Hopefully I never have another claim that I have to file again, uh, let alone one that I need to bring through the legal system? Or do you think they're going to see big insurance company more often in that forum, in that arbitration forum? They're going to see the big defendant because they have thousands of customers, millions of customers across the country. And so that arbitrator sees them again and again. Their bread is getting buttered by that party. And, um, and so you're at a disadvantage as an individual who is going to see them once in your life, if at all, versus that large corporate defendant. Right. If you've become a professional arbitrator and the way arbitration works in many instances is the parties select the arbitrators. Eat. Often one is selected by one party, one is selected by the other. The third is the so-called neutral. My problem with that is that sounds self-evidently not not like a neutral arbiter. I'm talking about in general. I don't mean the individual one. I mean the methodology itself, but be that as it may. Um, if you're the consumer, or in this case, just Chris Malik, you've not been to arbitration before. You don't know who you're supposed to select. On the other hand, if you're a big corporation that is an arbitration a lot, you know who the good arbitrators are for you because experience has taught you that. So you pick them, and even if those arbitrators are well-intended, they often have a point of view. And whether it's conscious or otherwise, you know that those big companies aren't going to pick you as an arbitrator if you have a history of, of ruling against them. So there's this inclination that if you want to keep arbitrating, it'd be good if you had a relationship with the company that often selects arbitrators. It's human nature and it's problematic. You cite a study that shows just how prevalent this practice is now. In 2018, at least 826 million, let me repeat that, 826 million consumer arbitration agreements were in force in America, 81 of the top Fortune 100 largest corporations routinely included compulsory arbitration in the small print. It's it's everywhere in our economy now. That's right. That's right. You know, uh, arbitration has itself become big business uh, and an apex predator of the Seventh Amendment, the right to trial by jury. No two ways about it. I talked a little bit about it a minute ago. We have been successful here in Texas at pushing back 
against the efforts of the insurance companies to try to worm their way in to getting arbitration placed in personal insurance policies. Um, that was a very big fight. Uh, we had to ring the bell and thankfully the Department of Insurance agreed with us. Uh, and we, we hope that they will continue to hold the line so that if you have a dispute against your homeowner's insurance company, because let's say you have a burst pipe or you have a windstorm hits your house, or in, a, in an automobile dispute, somebody runs a red light and hits you, we want to make sure that you have the benefit of taking your dispute into court where a citizen jury can sit in judgment of that. And it's not this inside ball game type process, which happens too often in arbitration. Uh, we encourage people to read contracts very carefully. If you see the A word, if you see arbitration, push back. Mark it out. Mark it out. Let them know I'm not going to agree to this. If you want my business, if you want me to work here, I'm not going to give up my constitutional right to trial by jury, just as I wouldn't give up my right to speak freely or worship freely or to keep the government out of my business. I'm not going to give up my Seventh Amendment right. Right. Um, and if they condition. and if they have a problem with that, go find someone who won't because, it, you know, whether you're hiring somebody to paint your house or, or you know, help you build a an addition, you know, to your home or whatever we're talking about, somebody will want to do that work, right? right. Without you know you agreeing to waive a constitutional right, and if they won't, that should tell you that you probably don't want to do business with. I want to turn now to another practice that is so prevalent in this country and has had just a horrendous toll on so many Americans, the opioid epidemic. I believe since 2017, you've been focusing a lot of your law practice, Jeffrey, on helping our local communities who are struggling under the weight of this epidemic. You cite some statistics in the book. There have been more than 500,000 deaths from accidental opioid overdoses just in the last few years, over 107,000 lives taken in 2021. You cite a study from The Lancet estimating 1.2 million more people in North America will die by 2029. You know, we know we have a, a homelessness epidemic all across the country. A lot of the folks that we see under our bridges uh, may have started their addiction with an OxyContin prescription that they should sure. not have received. And it, it's placed a huge burden on our first responders who are having, whether you're a police officer, a firefighter, EMS, having to come out and, and try to help these folks. Our librarians in our public libraries are having to administer drugs to try to save lives when people are overdosing in their bathrooms. It, it's just, it's it's a huge epidemic. And like I said, you focused a lot of your, your work through your legal practice on helping our cities and counties because the cost to them and the cost to all of us as taxpayers has been enormous. So can you talk about how we got to this point, how these drugs were marketed to the public, how they were overprescribed, the effect that it's had um, on all of us. Sure. Uh, rarely in American history has an industry done so much harm to so many people as occurred when certain drug companies promoted and distributed gargantuan volumes of highly addictive prescription opioids to doctors and dentists and their patients as essential lifestyle improving drugs. At the outset, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the opioid epidemic was caused primarily by aggressive drug company marketing of a dangerous lie, that the best and safest method to treat chronic pain is to prescribe opioids. And for the last six years, the focus of my law practice has been representing counties and cities across Texas and across America in cases against prescription opioid manufacturers, wholesale distributors, and pharmacies for their role 
in driving a drug epidemic that continues to ravage these communities. And unfortunately, the problem now is worse than ever because, ironically, this epidemic, which is the worst public health crisis related to a drug in American history, was not started by some shadowy foreign cartel. It was started by some of America's largest drug companies, but now it is being driven primarily um, by foreign cartels uh, who are exploiting this market with counterfeit drugs. In other words, non-prescription drugs like fentanyl. And we are unfortunately losing more people to accidental opioid overdoses from fentanyl on an annual basis than we ever did the prescription opioid oversupply problem. And that's because it is insidious. It's in almost every street drug. Uh, it's in basically five in 10, uh, 50% of, of every street pill. Um, and it fentanyl is incredibly lethal. Um, and in addition to, you know, all of this death and, and human suffering, as you know, the the financial toll is staggering as well. In 2022 in Texas, we lost as a result of the opioid epidemic, the financial equivalent of around 15 Dallas Cowboy franchises or more than Warren Buffett's net worth. Wow. The use of fentanyl and other opioids in Texas has cost us $50.1 billion in economic output, $84.6 billion in pain and suffering. It is, as much as anything, the number one job killer, as well as human killer. We lost 517,000 jobs because of the opioid epidemic in recent years in the state of Texas. Now, there are things we can do, and I talk about them in the book. One, of course, is education. The other is legalizing fentanyl testing strips because people will use them to determine whether or not there is fentanyl in their drug. And there are studies that show that if they find it, they generally won't use it. The money that we have obtained for opioid settlements for use all around the state of Texas is now almost $3 billion. Uh, more money than has come from any other kind of public funding or certainly any other kind of private source. But uh, we have to enact laws and implement programs to save lives. It's not enough to just obtain the money. We have to spend it wisely and support it uh, with our system of laws. And one of the things that we have to do is understand that opioid addiction and drug addiction in general is not a character flaw. It is a chronic brain disease. This is not a comment that emanates from just some sense of mercy or some kind of progressive temperament. It is a physiological fact that opioid addiction is the chemical alteration of the brain's motivational priorities, a literal chemical and physical transformation where feeding the addiction to avoid withdrawal symptoms becomes the number one imperative. And so we don't want to treat people who are opioid addicted like criminals to be jailed. We want to treat them like patients to be treated. Even the ones that break laws in support of their need to feed their addiction because we want to get their addiction into a place of remission where they don't, won't then offend, which threatens public safety. And uh, one of the really rewarding things for me in this litigation, uh, in addition to developing relationships with people in county government all over the state, including plenty of people that don't have the same political perspectives I do, but they absolutely share the belief that we need to treat the opioid epidemic as a public health crisis to be solved rather than, you know, malfeasance to be punished, right? But at the same time, understand that fentanyl dealers, 
need to be punished even more uh, severely in the criminal justice system uh, than ever before. And my last comment about this is we hear all this talk about the immigration crisis and all these different political perspectives about what to do. And what I'm saying is that no matter who's right or wrong about any aspect about how we should handle immigration and immigration law differently, it is an irrefutable fact that the most dangerous form of legal immigration in the United States is the trafficking of illicit fentanyl across our southern border. More people die in Texas and across America from the trafficking of illicit fentanyl than from any other kind of illegal immigration. And that 95% of that fentanyl comes across our border through legal points of entry, concealed in the compartments of cars and trucks, and that there exists technology to do infrared screening of those cars and trucks as they come across and use artificial intelligence to understand who the offenders are that we're not using. The money is there and we need to show the legislative will to use it. It's it's such a huge problem and, and so much more has to be done. I think it's important for everyone to note that the federal government did not protect us here. The, the FDA did not protect us from the overprescription of opioids. And here we are. And it, it took the jury system to start to claw back some of this money to help protect our communities. So when we talk about the jury holding power to account, the jury system is what held Big Pharma to account here. And, and the billions of dollars that you and other great attorneys have helped to recover for this state, for our cities, for our counties, can be put to good use in helping people restore their health and come back to productive life in, in our society. One of the best things I saw, I believe you recovered $75 million for Narcan to be used yes. across Texas. Can you talk about that, Jeffrey? Yes. Uh, one of the settlements we did with a company was with a company called Teva Pharmaceuticals, and they make generic prescription drugs as well as uh, branded ones. And the result of that is they're lower cost drugs. And one of the things that we, along with the state of Texas, with whom we worked in, in negotiating these settlements, uh, insisted upon and they agreed to, was it's not just that they need to pay money and they, they, they did pay a substantial sum of money, provide $75 million worth of the opioid rescue drug Narcan at wholesale acquisition cost. Let's put it immediately to work. And they did do so. And I have heard from many people that, um, you know, it's made an, an important uh, impact because when administered in time, Narcan or its generic form, naloxone, will reverse an opioid overdose 92% of the time. If administered in time, it will save that person's life who is in the, thro in the throes of an opioid overdose in 92 out of 100 cases. And saving their lives gives them a chance to get them into treatment so that we can get their addiction under control. But if we lose them to overdose, obviously there's no addiction to be treated. You're, you're, you're directly saving lives. You're literally saving lives. You're saving taxpayers' dollars. Um, you took on the big giant, <laughs> big pharma, you and, and other great attorneys. I, I commend all of you. I can't imagine how hard that fight was, uh, the resources that it took, the risk that you took in doing that. And I just want to say on, on behalf of so many folks, out there, thank you, uh, because I'm sure it's many nights away from your family um, working really hard to save those lives and recover those dollars for our cities and counties, which help us in so many ways. Thank you for that. And as you touched upon, it was a group effort uh, within my firm and with other firms across the state 
Uh, you know, one of the many blessings in this work is I have gotten to work with some of the very best lawyers I've ever known. It is a great privilege, and we've done some good together. In the time we have remaining, I, I want to pull out a quote from the book that I thought really crystallized a lot of the work that we do here at Texas Watch. You know, we oppose tort reform at, at Texas Watch, torts again being civil harms. This, this term tort reform is really misleading because it sounds like it's something that's very modest and benign. And, and really what it is, is tort deform. Right. Um, large corporations want to deform our laws. They want to tip the scales of justice very much in their favor. They want to put their thumb on the scale of justice so that they can't lose and hardworking people can't win. And so that they can, they can, make profits in that way. And that's not the way that I'm a free market capitalist. Um, I want people to make profits, make profits by having a superior product, having better services. That's how you make a profit. You don't make profits by hurting your workers or hurting your customers and not being held accountable for it. And so you have this quote, and I'm quoting directly from the book, pro-business objectives need not be anti-health, anti-consumer, nor anti-worker, but too often are. Speak more about that, please, Jeff. Sure. And, and before I do, I want to make a point, which is that neither you nor Texas Watch are looking for any compliments, but you certainly deserve it. The work you are doing is essential, in addition to magnificent, for the protection of public safety, our system of laws, judicial integrity, and the protection of individual freedoms. And uh, if anybody uh, can pick up anything from my book, that'd be great. But make sure you pay attention to Texas Watch. They are doing magnificent things for you. Um, look, I, like you, am a free market capitalist. I believe uh, in uh, a market economy that is a meritocracy. But I don't like any rigged system of anything, whether it's a rigged system of law, whether it's a rigged market. And tort reform is a scam. And the reason it's a scam is, is because it is never intended to right or wrong. It's simply intended to deprive a consumer right in favor of large corporations that have it packaged right through slick pr and legislators that they financially support as something you need you as a taxpayer you as the as the insured you as a patient it's not right medical malpractice deform in texas has hurt patients the idea that should a healthcare provider most of them being competent and most of them being uh, 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 compassionate, but some aren't. Should a healthcare provider really harm you or someone you love through recklessness, that no matter, cut off the wrong leg, right, leave you or someone you love brain damaged because of an avoidable mistake, that if that happens and a lifelong bout with pain and emotional misery ensues that no matter how long that life is no matter how severe that suffering it's only worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars because there's a law that says so which we now have and have had since 2003 that is barbaric the idea that that's just somehow good for business misses the larger point it's terrible for patients it's terrible for you if god forbid that were to happen to you, right? None of us is immune from the harms that can occur, including a reckless error made by a professional from whom we're supposed to be receiving care. And the reason that it's a scam is not just because its intentions are not what they're conveyed to be. It's not to protect you. It's just to benefit uh, some company or industry more powerful than you that doesn't want to be held accountable in the system of laws for mistakes they make, especially injuries they cause. 
It's that these laws never require that any of the cost benefits actually pass through to the consumer or patient or insured who's allegedly going to be benefited by them. As I talk about in the book, we've had tort reform since 2003. The justification for it was, is that we needed it to lower health care costs in Texas for everyone involved. And yet health care costs in Texas have skyrocketed since 2003. Yes. There was a study in 2018 I talk about in the book, which determined that we haven't saved a nickel in health care costs because of any kind of tort reform, not any. And in fact, it has risen in Texas. The cost of health care has risen in Texas higher than the national average. And on top of that, we're not an expanded Medicaid state, so we're the most underinsured state in America. Our lawmakers for the last 20 years in Texas who have been pushing for tort reform have misled you. It has never been in your interest to make industries, corporations, or health professionals, or any other kind of professional effectively immune from the harm they cause. I am a lawyer and I represent clients with great privilege. And if I commit legal malpractice such that I harm one of my clients economically, they should be able to sue me, right? And if we don't resolve the case, a jury should decide the amount of harm I've caused them. I shouldn't have some predetermined cap or predetermined immunity because that belongs to the judgment of jurors. And if it's true for me, it should be true for any other healthcare professional, any other kind of professional, any kind of industry, any kind of company. The Seventh Amendment was intended by our framers and court deform was not. It's that simple. It's un-American. If you believe in personal responsibility, you have to oppose tort reform because it's allowing people to hurt other people and to get away with it, to impose those costs on them and make them suffer, make their family suffer, and you get off scot-free. Um, it's not fair. It's not right. It's not what the framers intended. It's why we rebelled against the crown. And it's why we have to fight for the jury system. It, it's so important for protecting all of us uh, whether we're a patient, a consumer, or a worker. And I often tell folks, our justice system, our jury system, is the backbone of our economy. It's not a job killer. It's the reason you have a job. Because our courts and our juries enforce contracts. They make sure that each side is upholding their end of the bargain, that they're performing under the contract. And our jury system is how we make sure that your workplace is safe. That's so right. that you can go to work, be a productive worker, help to sell that product or provide that service that makes the world go round in our capitalist economy, which you and I both support. But the backbone, the foundation, the underpinning of this wonderful economy, still the best in the world, is our court system. And that citizen juror who's sitting in judgment, weighing the evidence, figuring out Who's telling the truth? Who should win? Who should lose according to the facts? Right. Asbestos is not banned in the United States. It should be, but it's not. And lots of FDA approved drugs that really harmed people, right, are now off the market. Just like asbestos is no longer deliberately added to products, not because of federal regulation, federal regulation failed, but because the civil justice system worked because juries held bad companies accountable for the harm they caused to people. And so if you believe in a free America, right, one that is not overregulated, let the civil justice system work rather than a hostile corporate takeover of it. Very well said, Jeffrey. You talk about lawyers taking up these fights and fighting for rights, but then you talk about how we need the public to get engaged. And that, of course, is what we do at Texas Watch. It's what we've done for over 25 years, making sure that that folks know what's happening, what the threats are to their safety and to accountability and justice all across our state, across our country. 
you speak in the book about the importance of jury service and why jury selection must be fair. Can you talk more about that? Sure. Um, jury service is never convenient because you always have other things you need to be doing and you weren't planning on this. But this is a classic golden rule issue. Make yourself available for jury service when called upon, as inconvenient as it is, so that somebody will do that for you in your desperate hour when you wind up in a legal dispute, whether a plaintiff or a defendant, that you never imagined would happen. That somebody you trusted cheats you or somebody you trusted accused you of cheating even though you didn't do it. Or a drunk driver crosses the road and hits someone you, you love or God forbid you, right? We never know if or when we're gonna need a jury, but we really need it when we really need it. And so for the good karma and just for literally the support of the jury system so that it's there for you and for your neighbor, Make yourself available for jury service when summoned. Additionally, we need to pay more attention to which of our lawmakers support the civil justice system and which ones look to undermine it. This is not a Republican or Democrat or independent issue exclusively, right? Some Republicans are real guardians of the civil justice system and some Democrats are less so. And similarly, some Democrats are magnificent in guarding your Seventh Amendment rights, and some Republicans look to take them away. Knowing their political affiliation doesn't tell you whether they're good or bad on affirming and protecting the Seventh Amendment, but knowing where they are on that is an important priority in how you vote, at least it needs to be. And the same is true for judicial candidates, which are, of course, also elected in the state of Texas. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is most judges are good, but some judges aren't. They have their own agendas and they apply them in ways which undermine the Seventh Amendment. One of them is enforcing forced arbitration provisions when they shouldn't, when there's not a meeting of the minds. There's not equal bargaining power in their enforcement. And the second is, is Trial court judges who just don't like trying cases, who look for ways not to try cases. And in one of the ways they do that is rubber stamping every arbitration provision. And the other way to do that is not giving the litigants a fair opportunity to select an impartial jury. Selecting an impartial jury, our process we call voir dire, takes some time, right? In a complicated civil case, it can take a couple of days. And that makes sense. The stakes are high, and both parties are entitled to an impartial jury, not a guaranteed result. And getting to that process, finding jurors who can be objective, who will not superimpose their own personal experiences or political ideologies over the evidence, can take time. Judges who unfairly limit that time because they just want to get the case over with often skew the results of the trial apart from the merits, because they seat jurors who are biased one way or the other. And we should pay some attention to that as voters. Do trial court judges allow robust jury selection? If they don't, vote against them. On the Court of Appeals, do they respect the judgments of juries? Because remember, it's the juries that hear the evidence. If they have a history of not doing that, vote against them, irrespective of political stripe because it's the Seventh Amendment, not whether one's a Republican or a Democrat that's directly at issue. We tell folks all the time, knowledge is power, and it's so important to educate yourself and to get engaged in the fight for your rights. We're a nonpartisan organization. Whatever your political persuasion is, you have to make sure that your rights are not taken from you because rights lost are not easily regained. The book, once again, is Last Rights, The Fight to Save the Seventh Amendment. If folks want to learn more, Jeffrey, where can they pick up a copy of this book? The book is available uh, on many different platforms, both in print and audiobook. I perform the audiobook myself. I guess that's a warning. Um, <laughs> it's published um, by Dorrance Publishing, which is, I think, Dorrance.com, but it's also available on Amazon, Target, uh, I believe Walmart, Books A Million, 
lots of different places where you would uh, obtain a, a book either in print or in digital form or an audio book. Um, and also um, I'm on, on Twitter at, 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 at JeffreyBSimon.com. And if you reach out to me uh, and you want information about how to get the book, uh, I'm going to make sure you get it. it. It's obvious, Professor, that this is a labor of love. Um, you took thousands of hours, I'm sure, to produce this book because it's deeply researched. And as informative as it is, it's also entertaining uh, because you weave in all these personal stories, very poignant stories as well from your from your long career as an attorney. So I commend you. I thank you. Um, this is a really important book for everyone to read. It's it's one of those that you want to buy a couple of copies and give them to your friends as well so that they can get engaged in the fight for their rights. So again, Professor Simon, thank you so much for joining us today and discussing Last Rights, the fight to save the Seventh Amendment. Thank you, Ware, and thank you, Texas Watch. It's just been a privilege to be with you. We appreciate you. Thanks, Dan.